the general subject for this series of messages, which was the subject of the most recent uh, elders' training, is the Christian life, the church life, the consummation of the age, and the coming of the Lord. These four matters should go on normally, consistently, day by day. We want to learn to live our Christian life with the realization the consummation of the age is nearer. And we want to live our Christian life knowing how to prepare ourselves for that rapture moment and to receive the salvation of our soul. And in the church life, there should be an increased awareness, a consciousness of where we are in time. Then we have to have the proper understanding that the consummation of the age is the second half of the 70th week, three and a half years. That 70th week will begin when the nation of Israel makes a covenant with a powerful European leader, mainly concerning the rebuilding of the temple. And when the consummation of the age begins, the Lord's parousia, his coming, begins with the rapture of the overcomers. Now in message two, uh, I have the realization this is a difficult subject to consider together for about another 70 or 72 minutes. It's something the natural person wants to avoid. But if I am to be faithful in love to the Lord and to all the saints in the Lord's recovery, I must present this message as clearly and as beneficially as I'm presently able to do. We're going to consider what it means to lose the soul life. What does that mean? Why is it necessary? And then what is involved with participating in the rapture of the overcomers? There needs to be a very special inward preparation taking place that will put us in the situation mentioned in one of the verses read, the two sisters are grinding. One is raptured, the other is not. Two brothers are in the field of their jobs. One is taken, the other is not. What's the difference? The Lord has revealed much to us so that we may absorb this according to our present capacity and go on. And then we'll come at the end to First Peter on the government of God and the Christian life under the government of God and how we will undergo the trial of our faith to prove our faith and the result of that proving will be the salvation of our soul, not the transformation, the salvation of our soul, which I say in brief now, we'll consider in detail later, is the soul is now freed from all suffering and rather enters into the wonderful joy of the Lord. So the outline, I'm aware, is quite long. 
But this doesn't mean the message will be unusually long. Uh, the clock I have on my table here looks like it's 1021. And a little after 1130, the meeting will be in your hands for your sharing. So let's go through this point by point. And I'll comment on those matters that need a little explanation. And before I do, let me just mention this. In the verses we read, the Lord spoke this. If anyone wants to come after me, if anyone wants to follow me, if anyone wants to be my disciple, someone under my training and teaching, this one must be willing to take up the cross, follow me, and lose the soul life. In Revelation, chapters 12 and 14, we have two aspects of the overcomers. In chapter 12, the man-child, the characteristic of these overcomers is that they do not love their soul life even unto death. Love the soul life. They do not. And then the living overcomers, the first fruits mentioned in Revelation 14, they follow the Lamb wherever he goes. And I want to mention this because we may have a concept, only the Lord knows who doesn't, who doesn't, we may have a concept that limits our understanding. What does it mean for any one of us to follow the Lamb wherever he goes? What does it mean for any one of us to say, I will come after the Lord, I will follow the Lord? It's not merely, brothers and sisters, or even mainly, following him to go here or to go there, to do this or to do that outwardly, it includes that. Surely the two dear co-workers from California in their 60s, at a great price with their wives, moved to Germany. They really followed the lamb to Germany. But the lamb is Christ as the spirit inside of us. In recent weeks with Brother Ed, I've been laboring on the outlines for the December training. And just hour after hour, I'm following the Lord inwardly. I have to go against my thought, my feeling, my concept. So this following of the Lamb, following the Lord, coming after him, applies to any believer who chooses to be a disciple. If someone is satisfied with, look, I'm saved, my sins have been forgiven, I've been justified by grace through faith, I have eternal life, Heaven is waiting for me. I just want to enjoy life here on the earth. I've been taught that we will all be overcomers, that we'll all be raptured before the tribulation. Deception after deception darkens them. But by the Lord's mercy, we are in the Lord's recovery. Under the vision of the age under the ministry of the age. And we have learned the kingdom truth, the truth concerning overcomers. And surely we all have the aspiration or the hope 
especially as we see the age coming to an end. I want to be there in the wedding feast. I want to be one of the co-kings. But my dear, my dear, precious brothers and sisters, we can't just live in a dream, in a hope, in a wish. We need the word to enlighten us, to supply us and guide us. If we want to save our soul life, we will lose it. So this is our decision. I do not want to suffer in my soul. I am not going to move from this place to that place. It will not be a pleasant thing for me. I'm not going. See? I want to save my soul life. That person will lose it. We'll see what this means shortly. But if we lose our soul life, for the Lord's sake, we will save it. Please notice, for the Lord's sake. Not for our individualistic spirituality. Not even mainly for us to be victors. But for the Lord's sake. That's why we're having this weekend blending conference. For the Lord's sake. And we're willing to devote our time and, and energy to participate, denying our soul life at least a little bit for the Lord's sake. In Luke 9, 23 to 25, the Lord Jesus taught the disciples to take up their cross and follow him by denying their soul life. In order to deny our soul life, we have to recognize it. We have to discern the difference between the soul life in us and the divine life in our spirit. To save the soul life is to allow the soul to have its enjoyment and escape suffering. This is the American way of life. This is the ethical standard. Do as much as you can to have joy for yourself and to avoid any kind of suffering, anything that will require you to pay a price. No, no. And the whole culture, the whole world is thriving on this. And here we are, going in the opposite direction. To lose the soul life is to cause the soul to lose its enjoyment and thereby to suffer. Why would we do this? It's for the Lord's sake. The Lord wants us to say something, to experience something, to pray something. To go somewhere, to care for someone or something. And our natural life doesn't want to do it. I've had a hard day. I just want to be home, do this and that. It's for the Lord's sake. We are not religious ascetics punishing ourselves thinking that will deal with sin. No. We are here following the Lord. And if that's what it costs me right now, I say, Amen. I will not allow my soul to have its way. Two, to lose the soul life is to lose the enjoyment of the soul. And to save the soul life means to preserve the soul and its enjoyment. Okay, here is a real, down-to-earth, actual illustration from within the Lord's recovery. Uh, just about two years ago, 
I was in a certain area of the United States for a weekend conference. And it's an area that has a cluster of churches and saints of all ages. And on Friday night, I I just let everybody know, the meeting on Saturday evening will be of particular importance because a very weighty burden will be released. And so we gather together Saturday evening. And I'm not scrutinizing the audience, but some of the co-workers were. And after the meeting, they pointed out many of the young working saints, especially those that have affluent jobs at these high-tech companies, they were not there. And one brother, he told me about something called Instagram, and he's on there for a reason. Then he checked. And those very saints that were there on Friday, Saturday night was their time, pleasure time. Oh, we're at a Warriors basketball game. Oh, we're at a gourmet restaurant. This is having the church life with one foot in the world and one foot in the church. Anyone who chooses to say Saturday night is not conference time for me. Saturday night is party time. Saturday night is fun time. Saturday night is pleasure time. And other saints will enjoy this with me. Oh, we'll give you two hours, Lord's Day morning. These are beloved brothers and sisters that are heading toward outer darkness. I love them. My heart aches for them. At times inwardly, I weep for them. Where is the governing vision? Where is the priority? And so it's up to them. I will go just this far. We call it balance. Just this far. I think you get the point. Three, to deny the soul is to reject the soul's desire, preference, and choice. We must deny our soul our soulish life with all its pleasures in this age so that we may gain it in the enjoyment of the Lord in the coming age. That's what it means to gain our soul life or to save it. And here is the thought. Now I am, or you are, brother or sister, following the Lord as we are as we're learning to do. And if it costs our soul suffering, inconvenience, even some pain, I love the Lord. I'm the Lord's. This is the leading of the Lord. I'm one with him. I will not allow my soul life to interfere. When this becomes our way of living, when we stand before the Son of Man, he will say, in effect, well done, good and faithful serving one. Enter into the joy of the Lord. You followed me at a price. And now, That kind of suffering is forever gone. Enter into the highest joy with me. But others will get a contrary word to say, in effect, you can't be in the wedding feast. 
You can't be in the kingdom. Consider how you lived. You lived for the soul life. And so now your soul needs a period of time to be transformed and for you to mature in life. This will actually take place. We will all be for the Son of Man. And we long, as I'm saying this, I, I long for this personally. That would be the most precious words I ever heard if the Lord could say, well done, Ron. You followed me at a cost. Welcome to the wedding feast. Welcome to the kingdom. For we must deny our soul, our soulish life. No, I read that. Key five. If we allow our soul to suffer the loss of its enjoyment in this age, for the Lord's sake, we allow it. Our will is involved. If we're passive, we will not allow. Well, we will allow the soul. But we suffer the loss for the Lord's sake. With the uh, pandemic, my daily life has been quite different. I've been in one place in Anaheim, California for eight months. I haven't been in one place for more than six or seven weeks for the previous 24 years. And this is the Lord's arrangement. I'm not living for flying. I'm living for him. But my point is for the brothers to travel again and again internationally. This is a price. Their soul must suffer for the Lord's sake. So they can minister the word and Christ to dear saints in other parts of the earth. And this applies to all of us in our daily living. So if we are willing to lose, suffer the enjoyment, the soul suffer the enjoyment, we will cause our soul to have its enjoyment in the kingdom age. We will share the Lord's joy in ruling over the earth. And a certain thought the enemy might inject in the unguarded minds of some believers. And it comes from the culture. And that is, you can have everything. You don't have to choose. You can have everything. And that's what many ministers will preach tomorrow morning. You're saved. You won't go through the tribulation. You're saved. That means you're an overcomer. You're regenerated. You will be in the kingdom. It doesn't matter, they would indicate. Whether you love your soul life or not, lose your soul life or not, what is that? You can have everything. But we all need to realize, and especially the dear young adults, need to realize you can't have it all. No one can serve two masters. I'm aware of a situation right now, somewhere on the earth, where two saints love mammon so much, so much, it has generated hate in them for someone else. The Lord made it very clear, no one can serve two masters. His word is very strong. It should be settled. 
And if serving my master requires suffering in my soul, so be it. I'm doing this because I love you, Lord, for your sake. You're drawing me with your love to follow you. I'm not, I don't want to be a hero. I don't want to be other than a normal believer, a normal member of the body. I'm going to be among those who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Lord, please have mercy on me and grant me grace to live this way until the end. Now B, in Luke 14, 26 through 35, the Lord taught us to be absolute in following him and to hate everything, even our soul life, that distracts, hinders, and frustrates us from following him faithfully. Those verses are some of the strongest utterances out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus. To hate. Well, what does that mean? We don't hate our mother and father as persons. We don't hate our wives, our siblings, our brothers and sisters. We don't hate our children. But we hate the soul life that is behind this kind of love. Because that kind of natural affection in the soul life, what? It distracts, it hinders, it frustrates us from following him faithfully. Why would a brother and sister, a married couple, in the Lord's recovery for years, have a daughter or son who wants to attend the full-time training and will not allow them to do it, will say, this is not a wise thing to do. What about your career? You will be behind. You will be delayed in getting married. This is exactly the soul life mentioned in Luke 14. I know what I'm talking about as a father and a grandfather. The lessons I've had to pass through and I'm still passing through to love my wife and to love my daughter and sons and to love my grandchildren, not with natural human love from the soul life, but with God as love then the more I love them all, the more I love the Lord, the more I love the Lord, the more I love him. And they will not hinder me from following the Lamb. This is what the Lord is saying. Now I just read the subpoints and we go on. As the salt of the earth, the believer's taste depends on their renouncing of the earthly things. Believers may lose their taste, their function in the kingdom of God by not being willing to renounce all the things of the present age. We'll see more of this in section two. It doesn't mean that after this conference, you sell your house, you give away your car, you just get your clothes now from a secondhand store, you throw away your iPad, your smartphone, your laptop. It doesn't mean that. It means you learn to separate yourself from any material thing. Yes, we need transportation. But why is someone so outraged if there's a little scratch on their new Mercedes Benz, that's because their soul is in love with the Mercedes Benz. You see what I mean? We need to be separated 
from all these things. Otherwise, being attached to them will keep us from being raptured. Three, if the believers lose their taste, their function, they will be fit neither for the land, signifying the church as God's farm, which issues in the coming kingdom, nor for the manure pile, signifying hell, the filthy place in the universe, having been saved from eternal perdition, but being unfit for the coming kingdom, they will be thrown out from the glory of the kingdom in the millennium and be put aside for discipline. These words are spoken by the Lord to his followers. We shouldn't sidestep and say, oh, this is the situation in Christianity. This is the general situation in organized religion. Let's just set that aside. I'm speaking in principle now. There are dear saints within the scope of the Lord's recovery that are salt that have lost their taste. They're neither absolutely here or absolutely there. The Lord's word is so clear. If we're living the kingdom life through the cross, we will be the salt of the earth, the light of the world. But if We are the same in the soul life as the unbelievers with whom we interact. We lose our taste. And we cannot perish. We have eternal life. We cannot enter the kingdom because of this condition. So the alternative will be in another situation during the age of the kingdom. These are sober words, I know, but they don't originate with me. And I believe the Spirit will witness. They're spoken out of loving concern. I refer again to that Saturday night when so many didn't come to the meeting. I don't love those saints less. I love them more. I took nothing personally. I was not subjective about it. I care for them more. I will not give up on anyone. This word is for them all. I don't want you to have a tragic ending, so to speak, of someone who knew the kingdom truth who at one point consecrated to the Lord. And over the years in this affluent country, just became at best lukewarm. May the Lord just have mercy on us in all the affluent countries, in Europe, in Taiwan, throughout North America. Save us. Save us, Lord, from the spirit of this age. Roman 2. If we lose our soul life, we may participate in the rapture of the overcomers. So now we're at the point of learning, and we're just starting to learn for the most of us this morning. How can we be prepared to participate in the rapture. In order to participate in the rapture of the overcomers, so that we may enjoy the Lord's parousia, that is presence coming, and escape the great tribulation, we must overcome the stupefying effect of man's living today. The stupefying effect. Yeah, I'm not religious. I'm not legal. What I'm about to say is not legality. I personally will have nothing to do with all these high-tech online facilities. 
No Facebook, no Twitter was on there. Stupefying, stupefying, deceptive, lying, distracting. I just am so concerned, are you not for the young people that are growing up in this, flooded with this electronically all day long? And they're being conformed to this age. Their mind is being shaped by this age. When they come to a conference and they're stirred up to want to be an overcomer, then back it goes. So we want to be sober in the midst of this stupefied culture we're in. The conditions of evil living that stupefied the generation of Noah before the deluge and the generation of Lot before the destruction of Sodom portray the perilous condition of man's living before the Lord's parousia and the great tribulation. The Lord said it very clear. We read the verses. As it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot, so will it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Brothers and sisters, things are going to get much, much worse in this generation. I cannot pray ethical, moralistic prayers. Lord, improve this or that in the culture. I pray for the Lord's will to be done for the Lord to produce the overcomers, for the Lord to draw the seeking saints to himself for an absolute consecration, for us to arrive at the reality of the body of Christ, be prepared as the bride. We pray for your will to be done. We are an anti-testimony. As the followers of the Lord Jesus, we need to overcome the stupefying effect of the world's indulgent living by losing our soul life in this age. So let's suppose on that Saturday night I'm referring to now for the third time, a brother would say to his wife, You know, we have very good tickets for the Warrior basketball game. But dear, I have the feeling we should give them away because it conflicts with the conference meeting. And she agrees. And on that Friday, he goes to work and he said, I've got two excellent tickets for the Warriors game tomorrow is a gift. Some will gladly take it. So this is the brother causing his soul to suffer a little for the Lord's sake. We do this item by item, day by day, again and again, until it's part of our being. Once we are aware I have to make a decision. Follow my soul with his preferences, with his desires, or will I follow my Lord in this matter, in this period of time? It's not going to happen suddenly in the hour of rapture if it has not been happening continually in our living. Preserving the soul life is related to lingering in the earthly and material things lingering. Oh, I don't want to miss participating in the rapture. And I said, oh, my favorite tie. Oh, my iPad. Oh, oh, I've got, I've got to, I've got to text my granddaughter. Okay. I'm here. 
wait, the brother that was right next to me, where is he? He's gone. So there needs to be an inward separation, even from the things that we need. We need. We linger in the earthly things because we care for our soul's enjoyment in the present age. That's what happened to Lot's wife. We're looking back. That's all she did. Why did she look back? Because her heart was there. She was attached to the things there. And her journey stopped. The Lord is very clear elsewhere in Luke. You don't you put your hand to the plow, you don't look back. And Paul in Philippians said, forgetting the things that are behind. No one and no thing should be clinging to us, or we should be clinging to that. If we are. It will cost us the rapture. And the very best will be rapture with the harvest at the end of the great tribulation. The Lord spoke. I may mention this tomorrow morning. The Lord spoke to Philadelphia. You have kept the word of my endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial. Lot's wife became a pillar of salt because she took a lingering look backward at Sodom, indicating that she loved and treasured the evil world that God was going to judge and utterly destroy. She was rescued from Sodom, but she did not reach the safe place that Lot reached. Although she did not perish, she was not fully saved. But like the salt that becomes tasteless, she was left in a place of shame. This is a solemn warning to the world-loving believer. Remember Lot's wife. I wonder how many, and I say this with Kind of a smile. I wonder how many would want to attend all the meetings of a conference if they found out what the general subject was. And the general subject was remember Lot's wife. This conference will be devoted to ministering to you supplying you so that you will not be today's Lot's wife. And don't think because it was Lot's wife, it's only the sisters that are looking back. No. One brother was left behind also. We will come very soon to the next to a section, I just anticipate it now. How did the Lord illustrate rapture? What were the two women doing? Were they uh, were they in a vital group praying? Were they pray reading? Uh, were they PSRPing? I'm not questioning these things. They had to live a normal human life. This is what normal believers do at whatever stage we are. Now I'm at a far different stage and it's been quite a learning experience. Let me tell you. And so they're doing their jobs. But their inward condition is drastically different. So now, point three, then we'll come to this section I just referred to. Lingering in the earthly things for the sake of our soul's enjoyment 
will cause us to lose our soul when the Lord comes. That is, our soul will suffer the loss of its enjoyment in the coming kingdom age. I didn't comment, there's really not a need to comment in detail on the illustration the Lord gave about counting the cost. We want to build this structure. Someone so excited starts to build. Now he doesn't have the money to finish. So they mock him. And a, a certain army under its commander is about to engage a much bigger army. Then they have to consider, we can't win this. The Lord is saying, and please allow me even to say what I'm saying, is we have to seriously, calmly, and soberly consider. Are we willing and ready to lose our soul life as required by following the Lord? Are we willing for this? What, we don't know what is ahead. We're on a long journey. We will see this tomorrow, the Lord willing. But we can settle it now. Lord, here I am at this stage of my human life. Even I'm a young person, 17 years old. We'll go to an important university next year. I have my whole life ahead of me. But Lord, you may come and interrupt everything. I want to be ready. I will be a student. I'll do the best I can. Yes, I'll get married. Yes, I'll advance in my job. But Lord, inwardly, it's settled. It's settled. I will gladly exchange several decades of human life for a thousand years of enjoyment with you as our bridegroom and as our king. This is what Moses did. What kind of glorious position he could have had in Egypt the capacity that he had was tremendous. But he realized, I'm not an Egyptian. I'm a Hebrew. And my people are suffering. I will forsake Egypt and suffer with my people. And hopefully, he needed 80 terms in FDTW to be trained for his function. He wanted to deliver them from that, to fulfill God's purpose. So parents cannot decide this for their grown children. We have to know our limit. Here you are, a young adult now. You're not a robot. You've got to decide yourself. What is precious to you? What will you live for? Then we say, my testimony to you is, I've been living a normal life outwardly, but inwardly, it's been altogether contrary to the spirit of this age. It's a soul life losing way and a Christ enjoying way. Luke 17, 31 through 36 speaks of our reaction to the rapture call. These verses depict the soul life in its engagement, not with sinful things, but with the things of earth. The Lord's charge here is related to the believers overcoming in their practical life. 
It's the practical things that surround us that we need. To just be a normal human. How can we function in the world in which we live if we don't have? We have a phone that we had in the 50s. No smartphone. But I don't want to be left behind because I'm looking for it. Where's my smartphone? Where's my smartphone? Where is it? Well, Ron, you're not going to need it in the coming age. Uh, the, the communication will be in another way. But you may, we may think, oh, 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 I would never do this. How do you know? How do we react now to things like this? Whether or not the living believers participate in the rapture of the overcomers depends on their reaction to the call to go. The rapture will occur secretly and unexpectedly. So how can we plan a reaction. It's at the speed of life. It just happens. We don't pause for 30 seconds and consider what to do. Even that's a reaction, which actually means no. We just respond. A reaction. Because this rapture will recur secretly, and unexpectedly. Unexpectedly. This is all we know. We only know what is presented in the New Testament and what the minister of the age, our brother, opened up to us. We just know it will be secret and unexpected. So you have the two women Grinding the two men. They are normal human beings doing their daily tasks. But inwardly, they are radically different. Because one of the sisters is simultaneously living in the divine and mystical realm. Her soul and spirit have been divided So she can use her soul's functions to do her work. But inwardly, her spirit is free to stay in contact, fellowship with the Lord. And then we don't know what will take place. It will be instant. Just a sense, an inner sense. We've all experienced this already. Just this spontaneous sense. It's not from our emotion. It's from our spirit. So we pray, or we say this. But if we don't live this way, the one left behind will have no idea. No idea. No readiness. The Lord is not arbitrary. He doesn't uh, rapture one brother. He doesn't say, well, You know, I prefer you. I like your personality more than him. That's not God. He's no respecter of persons. We know from Revelation 2, he said, all the churches will know that I am he who searches the inward parts. The hearts and the inward parts. Right now, he knows. And it's a blessing to live in the light of the one who knows but loves and cares and cherishes and shepherds and heals and guides and trains. This call will not produce a miraculous last-minute change in us that has no relation to our previous life with the Lord. No, No sudden transfiguration. That is a utterly false teaching. Doesn't matter what you're doing. 
You could be yelling at the umpire in a baseball game. And then while you're yelling, you're raptured. No, you just keep on yelling. And uh, someone else is raptured. This is a dream to think suddenly everything will be fine. That's not life. In that moment, we will discover our heart's real treasure. If this treasure is the Lord himself, there will be no backward look. When the Lord comes openly, he will come as the the son of righteousness. But when he comes for the overcomers, it will be the morning star. Inwardly, we're watchful. You just have the sense. I see it. You're gone. Others have no idea what you're talking about. Wayne, what do you see? I've been watching. Inwardly, I've been waiting. I can say personally, by the Lord's grace, never in my life as a brother in the Lord's recovery have I had such a yearning for the Lord's coming as right now. If you would come right now, I would say amen. I'm not going to say, wait, I've got to finish the message. I've got to complete the outline. I promised to take my granddaughter to Disneyland. No, it's instant. It's an expression of what we have become. We need the cross to work in us through detachment and spirit, a thorough detachment and spirit from everything and everyone other than the Lord himself. Certain ones are taken because they have overcome the stupefying effect of the self-indulgent living in this age to be raptured into the enjoyment of the Lord's parousia. Are we not living under the stupefying effect of self-indulgent living in this age? This defines California. This defines the elite culture on the two coasts in the United States. Stupefying, self-indulgent. And here we are, outwardly ordinary people. But inwardly, we're another species, God-men. Living in the kingdom of God is a reality. Living in the divine and mystical realm. Praying for the Lord to come. Echoing the word. Come, Lord Jesus. D, in Luke 21, 34 through 36, the Lord Jesus warns us to take heed to ourselves and to be watchful at every time, beseeching that we would prevail to escape all these things which are about to happen and stand before the Son of Man. This is the Lord's clear teaching. It's a lie from the enemy to say this is the selfish prayer. No, Lord, rapture us before the tribulation. All the dear saints under the sound of my voice, save us, Lord, save us. We want to escape. We don't want to be here during that time when we have the choice of standing before the Son of Man. Should a brother not pray this for his wife, for his grown children, for his grandchildren? Should the leading brothers, the overseers of the souls of the saints, not pray for all the saints? For all the ages, whatever their situation is, Lord, we intercede for them. We fight for them. Cause them to make this choice. To stand before the Son of Man. 
to live in a manner that will enable you to rapture them before. Prevail here means to have the strength and ability, the strength and ability to escape the great tribulation come from watching and beseeching. And so as we watch inwardly, and as we seek the Lord and beseech the Lord, this will have the effect of strengthening us. Escape refers to being raptured before the great tribulation. It's a simple prayer. Why don't we all pray it sometime today? Lord, have mercy on me and rapture me before the great tribulation. Lord, I don't want to wait to be raptured another three and a half years. All these things which are about to happen are all the things of the great tribulation. Stand before the Son of Man corresponds with standing in Revelation 14.1. To be exact, the man-child is composed of overcomers who have passed away, who are with the Lord. They will be resurrected and raptured. The first fruits in Revelation 14 are the living overcomers. Well, we are all living. And I believe it's a precious prayer to say, Lord, I pray for myself and others that we would be the first fruits, that we will be the living overcomers standing before the Son of Man raptured to the throne on Mount Zion before the Great Tribulation. Now the last section, and the time seems to be uh, working well. I realize we're going from one uh, rather penetrating point to another, but I believe that's the burden. I sincerely believe now, I'm taking a little pause before I go to point three. Surely, as Paul said, we're all earthen vessels. But we are, there's a treasure in the earthen vessel. And I am fully aware, as I'm with you now, I'm just an earthen vessel. Please don't be Troubled by the vessel. It's the treasure. And I believe right now, and I mean right this moment, our great high priest is interceding for us. He did not arrange for us to have this series of messages just for some Bible teaching. He is for us. Paul said, if God is for us, who can be against us? He is for us. So many hundreds of saints have zoomed in, have used this morning for this purpose. So there's much feeling in the Lord's heart, much longing. He wants to come back, but there must be a mature bride ready for him. There must be the overcomers produced by him. There must be a group of people who have been losing their soul life for his sake. When he sees this throughout the earth, he will rearrange the world situation. The 70th week will begin. And just before the great tribulation, the first fruits will be raptured. How we long for this and pray for this and tell the Lord, Lord, I come to you through your blood just as I am. And you know where I am and what I need. Lord, please give me the experiences I need to be among the first fruits. I'm your disciple, your learner. 
I'm in your full-time 24-7 training. Train me not to look back like Lot's wife. Train me in what it is to lose my soul life. Train me what it is to be detached from the things around me. Three, the proving of our faith, being found unto praise, glory, and honor, results in receiving of the end of our faith, the salvation of our souls. We know from Hebrews 12 that Christ is the author and perfecter of our faith. So all of us are under the process of our faith being developed and perfected. We know from the parable in Luke 18 about the widow who was being persecuted and an unjust judge wouldn't care. And the Lord was saying you need to pray without losing heart. Pray consistently. Even when it seems God is silent even when it seems he is hidden. You know he's real, faithful, righteous, wise, loving. And then at the end of that parable, the Lord said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find this kind of faith on the earth? The Lord wants to perfect in all the saints who are presented to him as open vessels, this kind of faith. So there will be trials of our faith. And many of us, some of whose faces I, they can see, I'm not trying to make you self-conscious. I'm, I'm indicating I'm contacting real people. We're going through all kinds of things, all kinds. It seems there's no end to certain things. This is part of the trial. And under the trial, there will be a development. And the issue of this will be the salvation of our soul. That means when the Lord comes back, our soul has ceased its suffering and enters into the highest enjoyment that human beings have ever experienced by entering into the joy of the Lord, his joy. Now in about seven minutes, I just read through the subpoints with a few comments. As we live under the government of God, we will be made sorrowful by various trials and experience the proving of our faith. So if anyone here listening is sorrowful in this way, I say kindly, welcome to the God-man race. You're not strange. You're not a failure. You're in this process. The trials, in verse 6, are sufferings that test the quality of our faith as believers. These trials are used by God to prove and try our faith to see whether we will follow Christ in suffering. So this is a faith matter. Remember, the Lord is the author. He's the source and the perfecter. When he is leading you to follow him in a way that would be costly to your soul, he will infuse the faith. He will infuse into you the faith you need. The emphasis in 1 Peter 1.7 is not on faith, but on the proving of faith by trials that come through suffering. So for some hearing this at this very moment, 
you are experiencing trials through suffering. And I'm here with you to tell you, you're not alone. Others have taken this way. And they're a pattern of victory. The body will supply you moment by moment, whatever happens. The sovereign God is behind everything. And the great high priest is interceding and ministering heaven into us. But he will not allow the trial to stop And really, you don't want it to stop. You want the Lord to get through. And he will. He hears what you're saying in your prayers. And he hears what you're saying in the depths of your being that are beyond utterance. He is for us. Be the salvation of the soul in 1 Peter 1, 9 means that the soul will be saved from sufferings into the full enjoyment of the Lord at his revelation, his coming back. Full enjoyment of the Lord at his coming back. I'm thinking of the line in that song, Oh, what an hour sweet when bride and bridegroom meet. And love surpassing comprehend. Can I not say on behalf of all of us? We are living here and now for that moment. All of us for that moment. At the Lord's revelation, Some believers will enter into the joy of the Lord. And some will suffer in weeping and gnashing of teeth. There will just be regret upon regret. As the memories come up, you did this, you did that, you chose this, you rejected that. You can't have it both ways. To enter into the Lord's joy is the salvation of our souls. At the revelation of the Lord Jesus, his coming, our soul will be saved and we will be qualified to participate in the Lord's enjoyment in the coming age. For many, many years, I have wondered about a certain verse in Hebrews 12. And Paul says, look away into Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, and that he he endured the shame of the cross with the joy set before him. There was joy set before him. When our dear Lord Jesus was on the cross bearing our sins and dying for us. There was a joy set before him. We are not explicitly told what that joy was, but I just open my heart and tell you what I really think it was. It was his marriage. This is Ephesians 5. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. This was his joy. Brother Nee, a joy set before him. His last written words was, I maintain my joy. Incredible. On the other hand, normal. If we would receive as the end of our faith the salvation of our souls, we must not be of those who shrink back to ruin but those who have faith to the gaining of the soul. Many Hebrew believers in Jerusalem under suffering, persecution, were shrinking back. Let's stand as an army 
unshakable, unmovable. We will press on. We will not shrink back. If we lose our soul now for the Lord's sake, we will save it. And it will be saved or gained at the Lord's coming back. The gaining of the soul will be the reward of the kingdom and the overcoming followers of the Lord. Now in the last minute, and I mean that literally, of my sharing, I would just say personally, as you are able, when you can have some time alone with the Lord, just come to him regarding these matters where you are and just express what's in your heart and pray the prayers of longing in you with the realization he's waiting with open arms for all of us to seek what it is to lose our soul life for his sake what it is to be prepared to participate in the rapture and what it is to experience the salvation of our soul, to be with him and with one another in the wedding feast and in the kingdom. Amen. Your time now.